Okay, we are live for an emergency broadcast, emergency broadcast, last minute broadcast on the channel here, and uh, I'm just getting organized, so give me a moment, but uh, this was not planned, it turned out that I uh, had a little bit of time to do a show, so figured we'd do it, pull this up on the iPad. <clears throat> And give me a second here. I will find it. There it is. <clears throat> okay, Jaden's in the house already. Jaden is early in the house with bells on. <clears throat> and so I just actually took some some self portraits earlier and put them up on my Flickr. <clears throat> and the reason I took them, I took, I have um, some alligator, some Lucchese alligator boots. And there was a discussion about, can you wear them with a suit? Can you wear them with cuffs? What can you wear them with? What can you wear Lucchese boots with? This discussion in one of the um, Lucchese groups <clears throat> on Facebook. And so I figured I would take a few pictures of me wearing the Lucchese's with one of my Oxford suits that actually has cuffs, <clears throat> and then also with some Bill's khakis, and this time without cuffs. <clears throat> and so I actually think you could wear them either way, and I'll show some pictures here. And again, this is literally a last-minute scheduled broadcast. I just scheduled it moments ago <clears throat> and then went live. So this is mainly going to be for folks that are watching after the fact. By the way, this is the shot, the shot vest that I have on right now. And I think that would go with the Lucchese's also. But I didn't wear that in the photos. Maybe should have taken one with that on, too. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my photo stream on Flickr. And I'm going to find <clears throat> the photos in question. Okay. So we'll run through them real quick here. And again, this is mainly for future reference for people that watch later. <clears throat> and so, this is my indie jacket uh, made by Peter Botwright back um, in the mid 80s, late 80s, somewhere in there. I contacted him and he made that for me. And then after that, he started, when the internet came around, he started offering that service to everybody on his website, wested.com. Prior to that, of course, you had to write him, you had to contact him and send all your measurements and all, and he would make a coat for you. But there are the uh, Lucchese boots in question there in that photo, and of course, Bill's khakis and the Willis and Geiger shirt that I have on right now, and a Stetson fedora. And there's another shot, same outfit. And of course, the SBGY002 Grand Seiko Gold Stunner on wrist to demonstrate that it is a versatile watch, can be worn with just about any outfit. And then there is the faux pay bracelet, ditto for that. So there you go. <clears throat> Studies have shown that wearing an 18 karat gold bracelet like that helps ward off viruses. So think about that. Durr's in the house. <clears throat> and I'll keep going here. I love Bill's khakis. They're so comfortable, so well made. Got probably a dozen pair of them kicking around. This pair in this photo here does not have cuffs. A lot of my pairs do have cuffs. So there you go. Going to keep blasting through these. I always take a bunch of photos. Always take more than I need. There's the pants to the Oxford suit and an alligator belt that kind of matches the cognac color of the boots and a black Stetson hat in that case <clears throat> and there's another shot 
of the Oxford suit with the boots. Again, again, again. And they look a little darker on this monitor than they look on most monitors. So what you're seeing looks a little darker than what it normally does. But there's that Oxford suit again with the uh, boots. And I think you can absolutely do it. I think you can absolutely do it if you want to. You feel like wearing a nice pair of alligator boots. That's the last one, so we'll go back to one of these others. If you feel like wearing a nice pair of alligator boots and uh, a suit, absolutely I think you can do it, especially in this day and age where nobody knows how to dress anyway, right? Isn't that the kind of the case these days? So, let's get a close-up of the 002. And it's interesting, the uh, Lucchese folks have the same issues as a lot of the watch folks. <clears throat> God bless them, but a lot of those people have no sense of taste, no style whatsoever. They pick the ugliest boots. Lucchese makes some gorgeous boots. I mean, look at those boots. I mean, my goodness, absolutely gorgeous, right? And yet, some of these people pick these ones with the real ugly squared off toes and the double rows of stitching and like the 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 sole that kind of like overshoots the boots a little bit too much and has the double rows of stitching all the way around it and it just makes them look it almost makes them look like clown shoes you know how the clown shoes have the big flat front end right <laughs> it almost takes the gorgeous lines of a lucchese classic style of boot like this right here and almost turns it into a clown boot, a clown boot. So, I'm not sure exactly what they're trying to do with that. Let me pull up another picture so we can um, get a better look at what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> oh, speaking of Lucchese's, here's the lovely Lady Bree wearing a pair of Lucchese's and a Burberry trench coat that was customized by her lovely mom and uh, give me a second here and I will find I will find the photo that we want <clears throat> to use to demonstrate this situation the situation that we're running into here folks running into situations okay give me a moment and I will find it Okay, so let's pull up this picture right here. This picture is pretty, pretty solid, pretty representative, representative of what we're talking about. Okay, so see these these boots. These are the boots in question that I was wearing in the pictures, alligator, <clears throat> and you can see the beautiful shape to them, beautiful silhouette, beautiful toe, not too pointy, you know, just just right. The real pointy ones, I think, are not quite as comfortable, and they make the boot a little longer than they have to be. Boots are already pretty long, right? So, so there you go. There's that. Now, I'm going to pull up the Lucchese group in Facebook and show you what I mean. Just give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> Okay. All right, let me go to the Lucchese group. How do I get to it? Well, this is weird. I don't have the URL here. Oh, there it is. Okay, so... I will do this. I will do this. I will get her done for you guys. I do this for you guys. 
that's what we do. I'm going to the group page itself. All right. So here it is. Here's the Lucchese enthusiast, enthusiast group, right? There's the pictures that I just posted that I was talking about. And then, and then here's the other thing that, that some of these guys do. <clears throat> like, for example, those boots there with the squared off toes, not quite as attractive. You know, not quite as attractive. Let's keep going. There's Brianna's boots. Of course, they're stunning. And everybody says so. And then this gentleman, see, he's got a whole bunch of boots there. And see the ones to the left, the lower left? See that real wide one with the kind of the white colored, or the real light colored soles around them and all? I mean, you know, talk about being hit with an ugly stick. Why would you do that? By the way, boots should be covered with, you know, dust covers when they're not in use. But anyway, let's, let's go on. Even this one here, see how, how squared off that is? It's just not attractive. It's just not as attractive. Let's keep going. And then these, these are just kind of an ugly color. This one here in the middle, that he, that's one he's considering. That's just kind of an ugly color. So we're running into that issue also. There's Brianna's snakeskins and Brianna's ostrich. She was asking which they like the most. And these are pretty attractive looking boots, but again, a little bit pointier than, than I would have wanted, but not the end of the world. I'd rather go with this look than the squared off look. Okay, if I had to pick between the two, of course, if I had my choice, I would pick the one that I have, which is kind of a compromise, a little rounded. And then these, <clears throat> he was all excited about. Why would I want a seam in my vamp, my upper? Why would I want a seam in that to go wrong? I would want that to be all one piece of exotic. Like on my alligator boots, that's all one piece. And then, of course, there's another piece in the back. And then pieces at the top, right? But here he's got a seam here. And then he's got a seam going all the way up here on either side. Seaming these pieces of exotic hide together. Okay, maybe they did that to save money, right? Because smaller hides are going to be cheaper. And then you can seam them together. But um, I'm a little old school. I don't really want seams, any more seams than I have to have in my upper on my boot. I, I, first of all, I, do, I think it's a place to fail. The seam can come apart. And second of all, I just don't think it, it adds to the aesthetics to have an additional seam there. What do you guys think? Am I, am I all wet on this? Or do we have some issues in the with regard to boots as well as watches. The other issue that we're running into is people don't know to differentiate between the lower end boots and the higher end boots. They, they're not sure and so they buy the lower end ones thinking that they're getting the higher end one. And again here, here's another example, okay? I'll just show a few more examples here, but this can be applied to watches as well. See, see those soles, how those soles like stick out a lot from the boot and they've got the double row of stitching around them I just think that makes it look kind of hokey yeah I want a little bit of protection from the uppers I want the sole to come out a little bit all the way around but that just taking it that extra measure there it almost looks like the sole should have been trimmed off and wasn't you know it just doesn't look right it's not even close to being as attractive as as that boot right there. Not even close, right? Compare the two, right? Okay. So uh, let's see what else we can look at here. And again, uh, th th here's, um, here's what could be an attractive boot, but why on earth would you want that squared off to toe with the double row of stitching like that why on earth would you want that aesthetic? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's go. Let's let's continue. So now this gentleman here, he's got a whole bunch of them <laughs> with the with the clown 
soles. See, most of his have the clown soles on them. The very wide, you know, upturned, kind of goofy looking soles. What's the deal there? What's the deal there, folks? Let me know. Tell me. Am I am I totally and am I totally um am I totally off base here? Let me know what you think. Uh Barbers in the house, I find one's own personal style always supersedes what the public finds fashionable. Yeah, but here's the problem, Barbara. A lot of people, they've, I don't know what's happened to people lately, but they don't seem to have any kind of sense of style. They, they send, tend to do stuff every which way, and a lot of times when they've got a choice between a really attractive watch, for example, and an ugly watch, they'll pick the ugly watch. It happens a lot. Look at this watch. This watch is objectively, I'm not talking about subjectively, is objectively beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. Absolutely nobody could debate that, right? It's absolutely stunning. All right? So why would they go out and pick an ugly watch and go and buy it and spend their money on it? What, they want a diver's watch? There's a stunning, practical, robust Bulletproof, reliable, accurate, spring drive diver that is absolutely amazing, comfortable on wrist. There's not a, not a thing you, you could detract from that. There's nothing you could take away from it. There's nothing, no issues there. That's a good size watch, but I think a diver's watch, you know, a sport watch can be a decent size watch on wrist. But instead, people go out and buy something. Oh, boy, what they buy. They actually spend their money on this stuff, folks. There's in the house. Craig, <clears throat> have you seen that Seiko is introducing the King Seiko in a limited edition? Also, Indiana Jones Part 5 has been confirmed with Harrison Ford. Really? Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing that he's going to do another movie. God bless him. By the way, he also has Russell moccasins. He also has several pairs of Russell moccasins in addition to the, the uh, indie boot that is made by Alden, right? So <clears throat> he has both. And uh, yeah, I've heard about the King Seiko, and I think, I think Steve confirmed the other day that he's getting at least one. And that he has a wait list. If you want to get on the wait list, you can get on it. And thank you for clarifying that you pronounce this shot. Shot, right? That's how you pronounce the, the vest, the name of the vest. Made in these United States. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Okay, what else? Okay, let's just show a few more boots, just a few more examples. I'm just going down the stream here, folks. I'm not, I'm not cherry picking. I'm just going down the stream here and picking boots. Now here's one. Here's one that's pretty attractive. You know, that's a good looking toe on that boot. It's a good looking boot all the way around. Nothing super fancy, but a good looking boot. Alright, so I, I give credit for when credit's due. Here too. Here too. Decent looking boots. Decent looking boots, you know, just nice heavy use. Boots, nothing fancy, but nice looking. Let's go a little further here. Let's continue. And of course, here are my my boots. <laughs> yeah, it goes without saying. They're absolutely stunning and extremely rare. Those were made in the original San Antonio factory in about 1982. So very rare to see those. And... Uh, this gentleman shared these. These, nice, again, nice, very nice toe shape, about the same as mine. That's the kind of the classic toe that uh, Lucchese is known for. And here, by the way, I don't like the, see the one in the background, how it's kind of turned up, how the sole is curved up a lot. That to me kind of is kind of like a non-starter too. 
But again, they, they made them so that they're, the toes are kind of squared off and you really see the stitching. Stitching really stands out, but that's not nearly as bad as the ones that have the double rows of stitches. Those aren't nearly as bad. I do like the brown color in the foreground. I actually like the color on both of those, but if you notice, they both have seams as well. In the vamp, the upper part, notice there's a seam right where the mouse pointer is there. See that seam? Here's another one on this one. See, I would want that exotic piece of leather to be all one piece of leather on the vamp, what they call the vamp, the lower part of the boot. But not want that seam there. Yep, shot. And they also do custom fit jackets made to size, although they are not doing so at this time due to Biden <laughs> virus. Yeah, and, and I think that Wested Leather is still doing uh, custom coats made to measure, and they're reasonably priced. They're much more reasonably than something you would get from shot. So there's something to think about there. Uh, Craig, you prefer pointed or squared off toes? Okay, so I'll show you the toe again that I prefer, as the toe that I have. There you go. <clears throat> you know, it's not, not squared off, it's rounded, and it's not super pointy, it's, but it's kind of like the classic toe, the classic toe shape. I just think that's the most attractive of all the, the options they offer, and all three of my Lucchese boots have that toe. Coincidentally enough. <clears throat> and uh, Brianna's boots, both of them have that toe. Now hers are ladies, so they're slightly different, but they're basically like that. So there, that answers your question, G. Poo. <clears throat> that visually answers your question. All right, so what else are we going to address here today? Um, uh, let me think. Oh, Brianna released another video. She released two videos yesterday on Twitter. And I think she put just one of the two up on her YouTube channel also. And those between the two of them have about 10,000 views. So she's continuing to do well and build her brand. She's got a couple more paying clients that are paying for her to do a video for them. And so she's raking in the cash. She's slowly but surely stacking up Bitcoin. By the way, Bitcoin went back over 19,000. Uh, so let's see what it is now, see if I can get this to load in. It's very interesting. <clears throat> it's been hovering between the high 17s, well, mid to high 17s, and, and the low 19s. Like right now, it's just over 19,000. It took a little dip down. It was up to like 19.3 earlier, but it's $19,027 right now. So it's interesting, this tug of war between the bulls and the bears. Obviously, some of the longtime holders, some of the folks that got Bitcoin back when it was like nothing, <clears throat> some of them are taking their profits. And so those, those Bitcoin are moving from these early adopters into the hands of these big big players now big big players are coming into the space you know billionaires are coming into the space now <clears throat> and buying bitcoin so what we're seeing now is a transition we're seeing the big money folks start to come to the party so it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes for the early adopters to run out of Bitcoin to sell. Because when they run out of Bitcoin to sell, because right now there's not enough Bitcoin, new Bitcoin being produced to satisfy the demand of these high net worth individuals. These high net worth individuals are on a daily basis are buying more Bitcoin than, as, than is produced every day. I think about 900 Bitcoin are produced every day. Is that right? Maybe somebody can do the math on that. What's, I think it's 6.25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes is produced. So how many does, is that equal in, in a day, in a 24-hour period? I think it's something like 900 or whatever. <clears throat> so maybe somebody can do the math on that. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes for those early adopters 
to basically sell out all of their Bitcoin that they have available or that they're willing to sell, right? Some of them might want to hold on to some, right? They might, let, let's say, for example, a Bitcoin whale, an early Bitcoin whale, let's say they had a thousand Bitcoin, right? They might be strategically selling when it gets up high like it is right now, they might be strategically selling some, you know, in, in, in chunks. And at some point, let's say they get down to where they have only 100 Bitcoin left, right? They might want to keep that 100 Bitcoin just basically long term. They might say, okay, I'm just going to hold this for 30 years or whatever, right? Because they've already cashed out. They've already got a lot of money. Let's say they sell 900 Bitcoin, right? At these kind of prices, that's a lot of freaking money. And how much money do you really need, right? Well, everybody says, well, I need a lot. But anyway, <clears throat> at some point, they're going to run out, is my point. At some point, these early adopters are not going to have more Bitcoin to sell. And then assuming that these high net worth individuals are still coming to the party and still want Bitcoin... We could have a supply shock. We could have a supply shock and we could see Bitcoin price just spike like nobody's business. We, we could see something really wild happen. And my prediction is it, it'll probably happen late summer, early fall is, is when I think we're going to start running into supply shocks. And I think it's going to be very volatile between now and then. I think there's going to be a lot of this up and down. Uh, motion between now and then that's my best guess and of course it's just a guess because nobody really knows some people have some information where they think they know how many original gangsters you know OGs early adopters how many of those still have Bitcoin to sell and how much they have to sell some people have done chain analysis and they've kind of tried to figure that out right but nobody knows for absolute certainty, and, and nobody knows at what pace they're going to sell, right? Uh, so <clears throat> it's going to be interesting to see when that starts tapering off, when those, those people that are selling, the, we call them weak hands, right? The people that are giving up their Bitcoin. <laughs> when those start waning, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because clearly the new production of Bitcoin is not enough to supply the demand uh, that is out there. Uh, there, are, there are estimates that um, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, that those folks alone are buying more Bitcoin than, than, than what is produced every day. That just them alone. So, and then when you add Square into the equation between Square and uh, uh, Coinbase and others that have to secure Bitcoin, right? There's other entities that have to secure Bitcoin on a daily basis because they're basically selling Bitcoin on a daily basis. I mean, there are people signing up every day for Coinbase that get an account that transfer U.S. dollars into the account and then they want to buy Bitcoin. So... If the if the sellers, per se, on the exchange, if there aren't enough sellers, if there are shortages and stuff like that, then the exchanges are going to have to start buying Bitcoin as well to make up for shortfalls, right? So it's going to start getting really interesting, I think. It's going to start getting very interesting. Uh, Jaden's in the house. He says, big money coming into BTC. <laughs> yeah, there's some big money coming in. I think Michael Saylor has upwards to a um, billion dollars now, I think, in Bitcoin. It's just insane. Because <clears throat> he just bought another, what, $500 million worth. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right, well, we're, we're kind of slowing down here. And this was this was an emergency broadcast anyway. wasn't I wasn't planning on doing a show today, but it turned out that we had time. PayPal has Bitcoin now, no fees this year. Okay, so yeah, PayPal. There's PayPal, Square, 
the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, they all need to buy significant amounts. And then, like I say, there's other entities as well. Uh, let's see, Mike says, you're still not accumulating at this price, Craig. At what price would you buy again? Um, no, I'm, I'm adding to my stack every month. I add some Bitcoin. Not, I'm not buying a ton, but I add some every month regardless of price. As You could call that dollar cost averaging. So I add some Bitcoin every month regardless of price. I'm in the I'm still in the accumulation phase now. Yeah, even though I feel comfortable with the amount of bitcoin that I have that I don't really need more, I have I'm fortunate that each month I have some excess cash and I would rather you know park it in there that there's nowhere else I can put it. I'm not going to buy stocks at these numbers. I'm not going to buy any more real estate. The taxes on the real estate are getting insane just paid my real estate taxes on the place down in Florida. Insane. Uh, so I'm not buying any more of that. So, so yeah, if I have excess cash, just like Michael Saylor says, might as well park it in Bitcoin. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah, I think by default I will be accumulating more, uh, regardless of price. Because again, I'm looking at things long term here. I, I I could care about what the price is next week or next month or whatever. I mean, I'm looking at 10, 20 years from now, what's the price going to be? So if my dad can be a long term thinker and he's like 93 years old or something, well, he was born in 1927, so you know, to do the math. And um, if he can be a long term thinker, on Bitcoin, I think I can be a long-term thinker, right? All right, well, we're going to wrap it up, wrap, wrap, wrap this puppy up. That's all I wanted to say. I, again, folks, when you're spending money, measure seven times and cut once. You know, do the research. Make sure that you're getting the right item that you really want, and... Uh, That'll say, solve a lot of issues, right? You buy the wrong, wrong watch, and then you have it for a while, and you're like, oh, no, I really wanted this other thing, and then you got to sell it, and then you got, yeah, it's just all kinds of issues. So I think it's much better to uh, do, do, do some research, do some due diligence, and, um, and then uh, make that purchase. Uh, <clears throat> Greg's in the house. What percentage of net worth of, BC to, of BTC do you suggest holding? Greg's in the house. Um, hmm. And that probably depends on your age. Uh, if you've got your house paid off and you've got some other investments and you've got some emergency money set aside for, you know, what we call an emergency fund, you know, maybe six months worth of living expenses. <clears throat> Then uh, personally, and I'm not, this is not financial advice on this channel, folks. Do what you want to do. Uh, but personally, what would I do? Uh, yeah, if I was in that situation, I would probably put the rest of it into BTC at this point. Because I'm not, I'm looking at the stock market. I think that there could be some issues there. I think we're way up overbought on a lot of these stocks. Real estate is dicey because of the expenses and so forth involved. Real estate's expensive these days. I mean, it's it's just getting to be a real pain. Uh, so I think Bitcoin has the most potential to be the fastest horse over the next 10 to 20 years. Now, is it risky? Yeah, yeah it's risky. But I think it's, uh, for me, I think it's the best bet over the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, uh, it's not painful because there's not all these expenses associated with it like there is with real estate. I love real estate. And I've got the real estate I have. I'm not planning on selling. I'm not going to sell my house in Florida and buy, you know, Bitcoin with it, right? So I'm going to keep the real estate that I have. Uh, but I'm not buying any more. So, yeah. 
Craig, I have all those elements covered. I'm thinking 1% to 2%. Oh, 1% to 2% of net worth? Well, yeah, I mean, there's no no risk there. I mean, <laughs> I thought you were talking about, you know, 50% or 75% or something. Yeah. Where are you putting the rest? That's the question. If you're only putting 1% to 2% in, in uh, BTC, where are you putting the rest of the money? I think that's the question to ask. So, so yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I think a lot of the high net worth individuals that are coming in, that's what they're doing. They're putting just a couple of percent of their money in. Uh, and Greg says he's 60 years old. I'm 62. Okay. Uh, so 1% to 2%. Yeah, that's what a lot of high net worth individuals are doing. And I think some of them are starting to bump it up to 5%. But then you have other folks that are very bullish that are doing a lot more than that. A lot more than that. Because their their rationale is, what's my other option? Buy some overpriced stocks? And, or buy some more real estate? Which is, real estate is... You know, there's some questionable things there going forward. What's going to happen with all that? Is it in a bubble? So on and so forth. So um, a lot of money might... Uh, bank stocks, yeah. I mean, the banks could have some rough times ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I would probably rethink a lot of that stuff. But that'd be me. I'd probably rethink a lot of that. But uh, do what you will. But yeah. One to two percent, that seems very conservative. <clears throat> very conservative. All right, I'm going to wrap it up, wrap, wrap, wrap this puppy up. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. As we speak, it's back over $19,000. Just dipped below a little bit there for a little while. It's hovering right around $19,000 as is Bitcoin. So we'll see what happens. And thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you guys next time.